Hell yeah. All my stuff is good so I can forget about this bullshit and be normal. Hell yeah. Let's do it, dude. Sweet. Episode 25 with Matthew, I should have asked, Kohanowski? Kohanowski. Kohanowski, dude. Thanks for coming through. I appreciate you making the time, dude. Thank uh, you for having me. For starters, dude, anyone who is listening to this should have already listened to the new album. Revilement is out for Euclid. Listen to it. Um, Listen to it. It came out a couple days ago now. It's been sick to you. Yeah, watch all the reception. And yeah, for starters, if you somehow are here without listening to that, like go back to that first <laughs> and then come yeah. here. That's what we're going to talk about first. Cool. Uh, for starters, dude, how's that reception been? It seems like you guys have just been overwhelmed with love and support the last couple days. So the past few days have actually been very good. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely a step up. I kind of think like through our first album cycle into the second one, mm-hmm. it was just kind of like we put that out and maybe... You know, we had a little bit of a buzz to it, but not nearly as much when you make the next step with the second record. Mm-hmm. And it was definitely exceeded my expecta- expectations so far, for sure. That's sick. And it's the um, same core group. I know the vocalist changed. Kevin's a new addition. But otherwise, the band... Uh, uh, yeah, well, I mean, technically, the first album didn't have uh, a real drummer. So um, this is actually my first oh, effort hey, okay. with, with them. Hell yeah. For real. This isn't your first album release, I assume. I assume you've put out albums in the past. Or is your oh, first... yeah. No, but as far as Euclid goes, like gotcha. this record's the first one where everybody is creatively involved mm-hmm. and everybody played their part. Hell yeah. So. I know it's been a long time coming. I've been yeah chatting with Kevin and uh, yeah. Maddie, and I feel like this thing's been in the pipeline forever. I mean, it must be so exciting to finally have it out in the world and be able to share it with people. I think it was probably a, a good two-year process. Mm-hmm. What, like, the whole thing. what held it up? Like, I, Yeah, what... What has to get done before the record comes out that ends up taking so long from the time that you guys are get the mixes back? I know, yeah, Maddie's been hyped on those mixes for a while, yeah. and then there's a huge delay between then and the record coming out for all the marketing and all the different stuff. Yeah, what are you guys working on there? I mean, I think the whole process with like, everybody has their own lives and stuff, so obviously that comes into play with mm. anything, but um, I don't know. I, I think the process of listening through all the mixes and making sure that everything is like the way that we wanted it and uh, getting, you know, all the content stuff that would follow to roll out with it was also a bit of a process too. We had to shoot, you know, all three of those videos. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it was just, I think, I think it wasn't so much a delay in the, in, in the record being done. I think we just had, all of these things that we had to try to cover ground to where once we released it, we had all of this stuff to come out with it. So people have more than just that, Mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, like, it's like you can't release just a record by itself as a new band nowadays and expect a lot of people to check it out or anything. Like you got to add as much as you can to it, Mm -hmm. you know, and step up, you know, with what you do. So like, with the with the river pig video that we dropped it was so uh, sick yes please let's go right into it (laughs) i'm actually really really happy with how it turned out you know i never i i actually never really knew too much about the whole ai thing and and a lot of people are starting to use it now and um i mean it was just something that we we did and then we started seeing other bands start to use it before we dropped that video so then we were just like oh shit like Mm -hmm better have this out like soon before it gets old and people you know get tired of it and uh which is never gonna happen because the guy your your video is like the top of the line version of that like whatever the the first attempts that other bands have been making it's like they were never gonna replicate that but i can empathize with the the thought and the fear and of course as a band you're you're trying to manage every detail and there's only so much you can control but you're trying to reach beyond those things and control everything else that is probably out of your reach anyway um but yeah i think it's it's uh it's humbling, I guess, for me to be aware of as I'm putting out my own music video. I'm like, oh, I'm worried about this and that. And it's like, no, sometimes you have to be aware that you're the Euclid people with the top of the line stuff. And it doesn't matter what other people are doing because your shit is still going to pop off and be right. sick regardless of the other stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, I really think we, we knocked it out of the park mm-hmm. with this one. Uh, and it's great when, you know, I, I go back, like we all have our own jobs like within the band to, you know, manage all of our socials and everything like that. We do everything ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm the one that handled the YouTube channel, set it all up, put all the videos on there, put all the old playthroughs on there. Everything that we had, I put it all there. Mm-hmm. 
So when it came time to drop this video and we started getting the buzz coming back, you know, I was probably thinking to myself at least a few times, like, yeah, I'm, I'm ready for the, the, the hate comments, the ones that mm -hmm. are like, why would you do this? Like, uh, it's terrible, whatever. And not yeah. a single one has yeah. been bad, They've been, which yeah. is insane to me. Yeah. Not a single negative comment. Especially in this day and age, it's almost I know. impossible. I to, know. It's um, crazy. I'll just address that a little bit. Um, the, so the River Peak video is, yeah, again, if you haven't seen it, stop watching this. Go do that and then come back here, please. Uh, please do come back afterwards. But yeah, definitely go do that. Um, but the River Peak video is fully AI done. It's like a red theme. You guys are like undead zombies-ish. Of course, it's kind of hard to fully articulate because it isn't based in a, a physical art. It's a, yeah, it's yeah. computer generated. It's random. Um, I assume you guys filmed a video with Eric. You did film a video yes. with Eric. Uh, was the initial plan to film with him and send that to Mr. AI guy, who I'm drawing a blank on his name? So that's Wizard Head. Wizard Head, okay. Yeah. Um, um, I think we initially, when we shot the video with Eric, I don't think we really knew what we were going to do with it yet. And then uh, I think it was Zach's idea that was like, let's try the AI thing. And I was like, okay, let's, you know, let's give it a shot. So he found Wizard Head, and Wizard Head had done, uh, I, I believe he did a video for Meshuga, which had Maddie all hyped up because it's everybody cool knows guess. Maddie yeah. loves Meshuga. <laughs> um, I mean, it's also, the, they are the state of the art band. It sounds oh, yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but he's obsessed with them. Of course. Of course. Yeah, he's a super <laughs> fan. Um, but we found him and uh, had him do the AI edits for mm -hmm. it. and He's like European based or something? I'm not entirely sure. I'm not entirely sure. I don't know too much about him, but he did a killer job on this so, thing. I it mean, so crazy. It's, it's insane. What's your, when, I guess, how long ago have you first seen it and what is that first viewing like? Because I feel like when you're commissioning an AI video, like, I don't know how much you know what you're going to get back. Like, it is some kind of just trust him and he's going to make it yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, we did have to kind of like um, go back and have him do, you know, because um, I guess like during the AI, pro like the editing process, there would be some times where some like text and stuff would kind of like pop up in the in the video itself. Okay. And we and I mean, I don't know anything about it, but it would pop up. So he did everything that he could to get all of that out. Interesting. Before like it was all complete. It was like lettering and baked stuff. Baked into the, yeah, like, like just the river or whatever would have an R pop up in it. Like or something like that. There was like some, some words and stuff. Like, I don't know. It was really Were they really words weird. that were like, like was it blood or was it just like... Uh, no, I think it was just like, um, you know how when uh, like on a computer you'd have like a like a file name or like an EXE, like a dot .exe, like it would be shit like that. That would pop up. Interesting. So, yeah, just so he had to find all the shots that he could take all of that out and and then keep the keep the rest. What a weird problem! Like, I know of all the things that I'm amazed by that video, and I'm amazed yeah. by all the things that went into it, and that never would have been one of the things I guess that had to be solved to make this video yeah. work. That's unbelievable. I, I had never seen anything like it before myself. So. so the first draft you got was kind of underwhelming then, because there was these text things. No, in. like I mean, it was all practically the way it is now, but there was just like maybe like two or three scenes mm -hmm. through it where we saw that and it was like okay that's you know kind of interesting and then and then he's like yeah I'll get, I'll get those out of there and and it just came back perfect you know perfect <laughs> did you send him any references like how, did you kind of just send him or I guess what was the first video shot when you shoot with Eric what was what did that was that where was that was it in a field so a that was um that was Kevin's uh uh Kevin's longtime friend they have a, a paintball uh, range or I don't know what you call it. But yeah, I don't know anything. There about was that. like uh, a wooded area behind the paintball <laughs> arena, whatever. <laughs> the place where you <laughs> shoot people with paintballs. Yeah. yeah. The, <laughs> Who cares? So there was a wooded area behind there, and it had kind of like uh, some old structures, I guess, from when they used to play back there or something. And we just kind of set up in front of those wooden structures. It almost kind of looked like a castle, mm -hmm. and uh, we set up in front of that. And we shot everything there in that spot, and then and then that was it. That's crazy. I think the other thing about the AI that's so cool is like with a 
with a music video, I'm, obviously I'm really fascinated by the art of them and the purpose of them and just kind of the bigger picture of like, it has to look cool, but how, what does it do? Why is it important? What do we need this thing for? Uh, and one of the goals to me there is it's face recognition. It's a way to identify you guys as human beings. Yeah. And as we get into AI videos, I think we kind of lose that sometimes. It's so easy to generate stuff. And I think what's so interesting about the River Pig video is like, the vocalist is still Kevin. It still has his motions. Like it is still Kevin. Each of you guys are still like, as I'm watching the video, I can still see you guys on stage. Like it's, it's still you without being you. And it's such a cool and weird dissonance there that I think is so unique. Yeah. Sometimes we actually like send screen, like we take screenshots of the video, like, you know, funny parts where like Kevin looked funny and we'll send it in the like, group chat. And be it's like, a great meme. Yeah. Source, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's great. It's, it's, it's so good. That's wild, dude. Yeah. That must, yeah. What is that? When you first get that video back, uh, yeah. Had you seen screenshots of it or do you just get the fir- full what, or four minutes of it? We just got the once? full, the full thing. And then, yeah. you know, that, then we picked out, you know, where those, mm-hmm. those scenes were and then. He took it back, fixed it, and that was it. It's gonna be a jaw dropping first yeah. <laughs> first thing to receive of like Yeah. Yeah. Just I didn't know what to expect how, at, at all. Yeah. So I mean Zach was probably the one that out of everybody knew more than all of us, like what it would probably be like. Mm-hmm. And when we got it back, I was just like, holy shit. I, <laughs> I remember insane. hearing you joke also that like you almost wanted to put a warning on like, please be sober when you watch this video. Yeah. Like, please be aware that there's a lot going on here. There was a couple people that had actually commented on it saying like, you know, uh, this this is what it would look like as, as a bad trip or like, damn, I should have taken yeah. mushrooms before watching it. And I've literally like told those people, hey, be careful. <laughs> like, don't... <laughs> I don't want you to have a you know a super bad trip and yeah. you know something bad happens. Yeah. So yeah. it was like you know maybe we should have put a disclaimer on it, but hey, I mean, only you just got to be do. smart. That's yeah. all. And it's also not a not a medical disorder you're triggering. It's something that someone opted in for. Like a, yeah, it's a drug yeah. experience, right? It's not a it's not a seizure disorder with the flashing lights. Right, you got to worry right. about like that. I think we owe them a warning. And this is like, nah, you made your bed. You can yeah. lie in it, <laughs> but also do be careful that yeah, this thing could pop up on you and ruin things for you. Um, Hell yeah, dude. What else on the record stands out? So we got the three singles and there's the full body. I guess to me, the next thing is the the first song. The You start with like a two and a half minute instrumental song. And I think it features a, is it a cellist? Yes. Also? Yes. Talk to me. Yeah. What, um, what inspires that? So I, I don't know his name. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that he, uh, I believe he played for Leprous. Okay. Um, and also Zach's doing uh, and getting him involved. Mm-hmm. In, in doing that, and uh, I didn't know what they wanted to do as far as the intro because when we went undone, was done, um, you know, we kind of just, we didn't have that yet, so, like, we didn't really know what we were going to do with it, and then Zach was the one that kind of stepped up and said, hey, like, why don't we put a, you know, sweet intro to it, mm-hmm. and uh, and it just turned out sick it's so sick i mean it's it's so good i think it's interesting because as i first listened to i was like waiting for something like i was waiting for kevin to come in and he doesn't uh which at first kind of struck me as an interesting choice and the more i sat with the more i was like no that's so sick because the whole time i was like on the edge of my seat right i think if you i think the the easiest choice would be to come in right on kevin's breakdown like just let everything kind of shine yeah and by making it build up it builds the anticipation in me where i'm like oh fuck and that second yeah the first chorus hits the first kind of uh, I don't want to say full song. It feels disrespectful, but the first song with Kevin on it hits, yeah. and it's like, oh hell yeah, okay, let's go. Like yeah. it, it almost feels like a big intro for that, which is so sick. And yeah. it works as a standalone song that's melodic and kind of sets the tone and the vibe. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed that it, the hype that it built, the kind of anticipation of the intro. Yeah, I think we, you know, after uh, a few times of trying to separate the track listing up, because mm-hmm. like that's always been like a big important thing to me. So if like all the songs flow on the record, like that's how everyone is going to want to listen to every song and not like skip over track two and three mm-hmm. to four and go. Do you mean just like cohesively in terms of theme or do you mean like the last second of song number one flows into the first second of song uh, number two? So it's kind of, it, it's that too. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also, you know, it also is based upon, what Kevin does first, too. So, like, it's, you know, his vocal patterns at the start of every song. Like, that's kind of important to me as well, uh, where he comes in. Um, and I just, I think, yeah, just mostly just the flow of how, like, the last few seconds of the, the song prior to and then the next one going into it, you know, how it kind of flows together. And 
after a little bit of you know trying to figure that out, we we came up with this and. That's really cool. It turned I, out great. I don't think about that part too much with the ordering of songs. And I think in in the past when everything was an album, that was a much easier thing to think about. And now yeah. that it's more single based, I think probably people have thought about the the flow of the album less. But it's interesting that you're right that like we still do want people to listen to the full album. Both right. as an artist, you want people to consume the full thing, and as a business, you want them to sit in the the streaming room for longer. So it serves both purposes there, but yeah, how do you entice people to do that? And it's interesting that, yeah, as the flow, like, as I'm listening to the record, I almost forget the next song started. It's just a 45-minute or an hour experience, however long the record is. See, that's, uh, what, that's what we look which for. Which is so cool, we yeah. We want that. We want that from, from anybody that listens. Were there other, like, iterations of the album's ordering that you went through? Like, how do you, what goes into arriving at these, this order of the songs? Uh, lots of arguing. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, we finally all came together and said, okay, like, this is, this is it. This mm-hmm. is, the, this is the last one. This Interesting. Interesting. Uh, and what, did, I assume you're talking about the first song, like the last song also then like the anchor, like what are the things you're looking for to make the perfect ordering of songs? I think it just goes back to, you know, what I said about how, you know, the last, how the last song would follow through into the next one. And then, and like I said, me personally, Mm-hmm. Uh, what Kevin does vocally at the start is is usually a, a big a big thing for me. Um, yeah, I mean it's, it pretty much is just narrowed down to that. Have you ever gone back and like added an outro to something so that it can sit before the next song? You know, like you had the ten and there's just one between four and five that doesn't make sense, or is that like a, a crazy thing to do? I've never done that. Yeah. I don't think I've ever done that with with any band that I was in. I don't I don't think. Um, I don't even know if it's a thing. Yeah. No, if anything, it's just like stuff that gets taken out. Gotcha. You know, and and just left left alone the way that it is. But we we didn't we didn't really do any of that. Hell yeah. You know. Uh, aside from the three singles, is there a song that you would tell people to check out? Is there one that stands out as Matt's personal song, your personal baby on the record? Yes. Yeah, so my personal favorite is Escape, the second track. Okay. And yeah, that's definitely my personal favorite. It's just got just the right flow. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it, you know, it's always the fast stuff. Of course, yeah. You know, I always, yeah. always love the fast stuff. <laughs> so, I mean, that that was definitely like my my standout song. That you know, between that one and probably, uh, probably between uh, Beast King and and Unit Seven Thirty One. Hell yeah! Because both of those tracks, you know, that's like my full potential coming out i mean pretty much everybody's full potential coming out that's cool um not that we didn't give it 110 with every song but mm-hmm. i'm saying like as you continue there, to grow you, and continue yeah, to expand yeah. yeah you can see like those were slightly different but also just very just on point that's cool you know for us so uh i imagine writing drums for you is kind of a nightmare and i'm laughing that it's like a, it's a good <laughs> problem to have but like a, you're a drummer that i've heard other drummers be like well, that's the guy which is a i think the flatter and you want to be yeah it's not just the fans think you're cool it's like do you have the approval of your peers and it seems like you've yeah. earned that uh and i think that's a testament to yeah just all of the craziness of drums but that means that everyone else writing drums is like whatever maddie or whoever else is writing is like they don't have your brain like you got a really unique brain and a a real unique way to apply all the, the dynamics of the kit. But it's, yeah, also, I mean, then you get a song and it's a MIDI drums that aren't quite you where they wrote something that you're like, no, that's not it. I mean, is talk to me about that process of, yeah, kind of being the drummer and you're both the foundation of the song, but also, I don't know, your start and the end of the song somehow in the songwriting process to me. So, I mean, for for us, when we wrote, when we wrote this record, um, actually... I would say going back to when we, when Iniquity was mm-hmm. going to be coming out, that was that was the first single. Mm-hmm. Um, every song that Maddie and Boomer and Zach had put together, um, you know, it already had programmed drums that Maddie would do on it, which wasn't far off from what I would do. So I would just kind of take what he did, and I would kind of spice it up a little bit mm-hmm. more. And, um, and then if there was something that, you know, maybe sounded a little bit better to me that I liked better, like I would, I would change that out entirely mm-hmm. and just record it myself. And, um, that process is very time consuming. Um, the recording process is not, I recorded the album in four hours. Really? Yeah. 
uh, in in a studio in your room or your in room yourself. Room. Interesting. Just These in stems room. out to be tracked, but you're so I re- you know I had my own studio That's set up. Unbelievable. Yeah. Please. Yeah. So I recorded it all, and uh, once I was done recording it, I would start editing all of it, mm-hmm. um, and then I would actually send some of them to Maddie for him to also do you know do his due diligence and, and, by, and editing that as well. By editing, you mean like re-timing, so each of the, the 16th notes is yeah, on the so 16th Yeah, so everything, you know, whatever. like it's, when you track something with an e-kit and you're using MIDI and stuff like that, you have the that latency. Mm-hmm. So in trying to combat that and make everything, you know, tight, mm-hmm. as tight as you can, because that latency is really like messing you up, you know, you kind of have to, just kind of move everything a little bit over, mm-hmm. and and that's pretty much it. You Four know? hours. So of course you have demos done, like you know what you're going to play, but still, it's yeah. It's Recording everything is just like the it's the easiest part, mm-hmm. especially when you know you have, like I had the ideas of what all the songs were like with the program drums at the start for mm-hmm. our pre-production, but then when I went in to record it, I just kind of like threw my flair on certain parts and did my own thing on parts that I thought would sound better, and then that was it. And it was quick, very how, quick. Uh, I'm blown away by how quick it is, but yeah. how do you, like how does recording an e-kit compare to a, a physical kit for you? I feel like the, I assume that a high-level e-kit is as close to real kit as you can get, but I assume there is still a difference there. But I would always prefer a studio. Yeah. But, you know, when you don't have the necessarily the the money to pay for you know to go to like who you really want to go to mm-hmm. to track things live in studio on an actual acoustic kit you know it's kind of hard so you know yeah. maybe like the next one down the road like we'll go and we'll do it you know the OG way mm-hmm. but this time around you know we had to do it with what we had and and what we had just so happened to work that's wild you know and to do it all from your bedroom, I think, yeah, we've, I think every other instrument makes sense to do from a bedroom. I don't know if it is literally a bedroom, but yeah. uh, every other instrument and drums are the one that, yeah, it doesn't seem like it should fit in that, in that space. So yeah. it's wild to think of, yeah, that all that all came together from there. I yeah. had to make as much room as I could because yeah. I, was, I was in my mom's house, actually. So, <laughs> like, it was, I don't know, maybe uh, like half of, the, half of this room. Oh, damn. Okay. And then, like... And plus recording equipment and laptops. It was a and- little bit like, like just as probably just as long, mm-hmm. maybe a little bit shorter, mm-hmm. but it was such a tight space and uh, I had to just like kind of fit my e-kit wherever I could. And I had my studio desk across from it, a dresser across from that, my bed sideways, like just Damn. trying to make as much room as I could. That's annoying. Uh, one of the lights just died. must have oh. ran out of battery. Oh, but okay. Oh, well, I will. Hang on, I'm going to pause for one second and yeah. just change one. Word. Perfect. Sorry. I filmed a music video yesterday, and as I was setting up, I realized that I used these yesterday and didn't charge them overnight. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, fuck, fuck, fuck. Um, yeah, I've laughed at I, like, every episode I mess up something, and it's like, as long as the two things record, we're good, and like, there's been yeah, some that are out of yeah. focus, the lights are off, and yeah, it's been a, a process for me to have to like, accept that it's not going to be perfect every time. And I think if we're talking about the album, it's a weird thing. Of, like, the album's the complete opposite of like, it's, let's make sure that every detail in this is so perfect. Um, which I think is a normal thing for us as artists, and it's been really tough for me then to go, it's not going to be perfect, I'm going to do it consistently, and that is the goal here. The challenge is to be here every week and make it happen, and if the lights turn off in the middle of the episode, <laughs> then <laughs> so be it. Um, but, hell yeah, do you enjoy that, like, the album process then of fine-tuning everything and making everything perfect? I mean, you mentioned that it's tedious, it's stressful, it's arguments, and of course those are all the the underbellies of it, but is it ultimately then fulfilling to have this thing that you've crafted each, each blast beat on, like each note on? I think when we started getting like the mixes back from Cody, Mm -hmm. uh, Cody Stewart, once we got the mixes back from him, uh, that's when like, I was just like, oh yeah, here we go. Like this is, it's all really like coming together, Mm -hmm. you know, because when you sit there and you listen to the songs over and over and over again from like pre-pro changes and whatever it is that we decide to do with it, Mm -hmm. You know, then once you actually get like start to get to the final yeah. product, that's like it's 
disco time, you know? I have the same thing with music videos, and it's such a weird thing of like, yeah, I've watched this thing a hundred times, and how do I still look at it with fresh eyes and approach it in a way where I can appreciate it and be proud of it even? Like I'm, and I'm hearing you say the same thing with demos. Like It gets to a point where before it's mixed, you just heard the thing so much, they're starting to go like, is this even good songs? Like, Do I even want to put these out? <laughs> like, Should we cut these? Should I add this one in? Should this thing from the garbage actually have made it back on? Should this chorus that we thought about cutting get cut? Like Whatever those variables all are i mean it's just, just such a daunting thing and i think in a music video there's a there's a comfort to me that i'm creating in someone else's voice mm -hmm. ultimately when i'm if i'm doing a euclid music video like i'm creating for euclid ultimately it's your name that's first on the bill and my name second and that allows me to yeah kind of take my own bullshit out of my own head because it's like what's, what's best for euclid fuck what i think fuck what i want like what is the best thing for this person gotcha. with an album it's the yeah, again, that there is none of that protection. It is as raw and as perfect as you want it to be, and you've crafted yeah. everything. I mean, that just seems so daunting and tedious, but I guess it also must be rewarding when it's all done. Very rewarding. Yeah. yeah. Once, you know, that, I mean, that whole process, like I said, it was probably a two-year process for us to get this thing finally f yeah. finished and done. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it was very, very rewarding at, and, at the end. Once and, we started getting everything back, and it was the way that we wanted it to sound, yeah. and it was just... Perfect. I'm sure yeah, you've put out other EPs in the past, other music videos, other, uh, I don't know, other albums in the past as mm -hmm. well. Um, how, do, like, the, how do the releases grow over time? How does the process for you grow and change over time? When you're, I don't know, 13, 16, and you're first putting your EP, is that the hardest one because you have no idea, or is it hard now because you know what it could be and that adds pressure and, yeah, weight to it? Um, I, I don't think I've ever really thought of it like that way when it came to you know, whenever I made anything in the past, if if anything, I would look back on what I previously did and be like, you know, I could have done something better mm -hmm. or, or something like that, you know, but I don't, I don't think it's ever been like, like that deep. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know, I will say this, though, with, you know, social media and the technology and everything that we have nowadays, if mm -hmm. like, bands like us and you know some of these other guys that are just grinding it out and have been grinding it out for for years now if 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 we all came out at an earlier time even it would be even bigger now i think mm -hmm. for for everybody yeah you know so i don't know i mean like i said i i really don't think too deep into the the process of like, you know, l looking back on previous records and stuff mm -hmm. like that and say, you know, like, oh, I, that was disappointing, you know, mm -hmm. anything like that. It was just, if anything, I'll pick something out and be like, ah, I could have done something a little bit different here, but yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. You know? uh, the, the, people the, still enjoy it. That's, that's all that really mattered to me is if people liked it, mm -hmm. you know? It seems like they have. It seems like the reception for this album has been just unbelievable. It seems like yeah. everyone's up in arms about it. And yeah, I must make all those all those arguments and all the things between the bandmates all worth it and it all pays off. And yeah, you can breathe deep. You can have that sigh yeah. of relief now yeah. that probably was lacking six months ago and this was all looming and <laughs> Just a little surface. bit, but we're, we, um. we made it past that. We're good. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. Uh, to also celebrate the release, we had the uh, show at the Webster, uh, I guess a month yes. or two ago now. So you're yep. opening for uh, Body Snatcher and Angel Maker. Yep. Um, that was sick as hell. So that's the first lineup for these five of you guys in Euclid, or first time performing with that group of five people. Uh, and I think it was also the first time back on stage for you in a little bit. I mean, what was Four that years. show like? Four, Four years. years. Um, yeah. The last tour I did when I was still in Oceano was 2019. Mm -hmm. And uh, right after that was over, that was the end of 2019. So going right into 2020 and COVID hit, it mm -hmm. just like yeah flatlined everything mm -hmm. you know like we were we we didn't do anything and and then i actually you know i was the one that hit up maddie and said like hey you know do you guys need like a drummer because i would just need something to do and just wanted to keep busy mm -hmm. and you know put some creative stuff into something new and and uh yeah so it was four years give or take that i was you know not on stage what's that like yeah coming back it's your first time setting up the kit in front of the crowd it's your first time transporting it all to the venue it's your first time getting up there and wondering if the in-ears are going to work getting the levels all right i mean i think we had everything you know pretty solid as far as like setup mm -hmm. um you know going into it i didn't have any really any worries mm -hmm. um as far as doing my thing at all is um, anything concerning or nerve-wracking as you go on that stage or is it just full excitement um 
I mean, it, it, I was a little nervous at first, you know, because it had been a few years, but uh, I think everybody was kind of feeling the same same way. Mm-hmm. You know, it had been a little while for them too, you know, since in depths and tides and stuff. So, um, yeah, I just I think we just kind of had like maybe a little bit of an overall nervousness, but then once you start playing and you start getting through the set, then you just like it starts to kind of go away, it comes out, you know, the, yeah. the good stuff comes out, the yeah. energy comes out. That's cool. Yeah. Um, hell yeah. Anything else to say about that show that we wouldn't have known from watching the crowd? I mean, it seemed like you guys did great. The, the video exists on YouTube. It all seems like it went great. But yeah, was there anything challenging that I wouldn't have known watching? Um, no, I mean, I, I really think that for, yeah. the, for the first <laughs> set, first set ever that we did, you know, it's uh, it definitely... I, lo- I actually, I rewatch it and then I say, okay, like... This is like the perfect stepping stone to start. Hell yeah! For for me, like I couldn't pick out anything that was wrong with it, really. Hell you yeah. know, at all. So, for that to be our first show, and then th- that show being what it was with with Body Snatcher, Angel Maker, uh, Pale Face, and, and Distant, mm-hmm. um, it was a, a great turnout, sold out, um, and it was just perfect for us to start. Hell and yeah. I just I remember. I actually remember hearing like through the the video audio um I th- I can't remember what song we ended on but I hear this one person in the crowd saying this is your first show holy shit dude mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah I mean for me like I heard that and I'm like that's that's what I want that's I what I want to hear that in the you know? I was like, yeah. love love hearing that yeah. you know that they're just like so surprised mm-hmm. that that we were we were killing it. We were killing it up there. Obviously, for Euclid as a band with a, a bigger show and a better show is yeah, in a bigger venue, it's whatever, in a better place, whatever. Uh, for Matt as a personal drummer, what makes a better set? Like, what do you what are you working on? What makes you, yeah, what separates you from the idealist version of Matt? That would be the perfect version of you at a show. I mean, it seems like there's so much going on. And I think with everyone else on stage, there's an element of like performance that they can work on and always tinker with. And, and when you're behind the kit, there's, yeah, it's a different thing somehow to me. Um, I think as long as I get my warm ups in beforehand, yeah. you know, I, I feel pretty confident mm-hmm. most of the time. Um, it, it really just all depends on like how, how I feel that day, mm-hmm. you know, um, Especially when I was touring, you know, you'd be in a different place every day. Mm-hmm. Some of those days you're not going to be feeling, you know, up to 100%, you yeah. know, because you probably slept like shit. You probably ate like shit, yeah. you know, the night before. And you've been doing that for weeks on yeah, end. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So it, it kind of, yeah. it does kind of come full circle. Like, so you'll see that in your performance one night and just be like, wow, that was, that was bad, mm-hmm. you know. But then the next night, you know, you could surprise yourself and be back to normal and say, wow, that was like the best set of the whole whole tour mm-hmm. you know it just kind of happens like that but so it's a I, consistency thing that we're really aiming for yeah so i mean i just i've learned to kind of like not expect too much from myself when i used to be i used to be very like hard on myself about it mm-hmm. you know when when i felt like i played like shit or mm-hmm. something you know yeah. but now it's just like you know what so what there's Mm-hmm. always going to be more and you know i don't write the stuff and and i and i can't play it yeah. you know so it's yeah. like you just think about those things and and then you know you get some kids that will come up to you after the show and just say well, like that was insane that was amazing so it's just like obviously they didn't hear you know mm-hmm. any inconsistencies and stuff like that so it just kind of makes that you know kind of even out it's you know? a it's a hard corner to turn there of like yeah recognizing that even if you feel like you're only at ninety percent that still appreciate that your ninety percent is something to be proud of even if it's ten percent. You can't shorter. go into it with with expectations of yeah. being you know solid every single night because it's just not gonna happen. What like helped you turn that corner? I think it's a mature thing. I think it's something I still struggle with of like yeah as a as a music video I used to get so anxious before videos and lately I've had more confidence of like no I'm gonna show up in my my job is to make this thing better than it was going to be. My job, because it used to be show up and am I going to make something good or bad? And it's like, no, no, no. I believe that if I show up and do what I want to do, I'll make something that I believe is good. Mm-hmm. My job is to make that better. My job is to figure yeah. out how I can improve on this thing while I'm here. And that's been kind of comforting for me. And it sounds like you've had a similar turn of corner in drums of like, 
I still want to do good. All these stressors still apply, but I have some comfort in my own ability and some, yeah, some comfort in what I've done and built to this point. What kind of helped you turn that corner from being pissed off at yourself if you, yeah, played 99% perfect instead of 100% perfect to, yeah, yeah this kind of more calm, mature perspective? I think it was really just the, the time away. Mm -hmm. The time away from being on stage and just kind of like practicing at home and, you know, I will say this about like when you're heavily involved in touring and and be in trying to, you know, live that full-time musician lifestyle um it's almost like sometimes you forget about why you did it in the first place. Like why you start like why you picked up that instrument. Yeah. It's almost like you you start to lose a little bit of that love that you had for it mm -hmm. because it feels more like a job. But, you know, even though it's it technically is because doing this is a lot of hard work, um, you just can't, you got to learn to like not psych yourself out because you're also there to enjoy yourself. You're seeing new places, you're meeting new people. Um, and you're enjoying this. You're you're enjoying this time at the same time as you work. Mm -hmm. That's and a, the amount yeah. of work you only put in, if you you know, a forty five minute or half hour set list every yeah. night, you're only putting in a half hour's work. <laughs> so, you know, you just got to kind of like think of it that way. I have the same thing with hotels, where like uh, somehow a hotel is like the most depressing place on earth to me. I don't know, like whenever I'm put up in a hotel for work. I go back to the hotel and it just feels like the most lonely place on earth. And just most of the time I would hate desolate. spending like days off. But the flip side is I've there. had to learn to accept like, no, being in a hotel means that I am far enough from home that I can't go home, which is like, yeah. it's cool that someone is this far away and interested in having me come out. It means that someone paid me enough that it's worth being in a hotel for the night. It means that I get to experience this thing. I get to see a new place. I get to, like, yeah, there's so many good things that come with it. I've had to like, consciously reprogram my brain to be like, no, 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 hotels kind of stink, but there's something good about them. And I guess you're saying a similar thing about tour is like, yeah, as you're out there, it just, you get caught in the mundaneness of loading in the drums every night, breaking it all down of whatever the, whatever the nuisance of, of being yeah. a drummer is. And I'm sure there's Which plenty, there's plenty, plenty <laughs> of nuisances. As, as a drummer, there's, yeah. there's a lot of it, Yeah, you know, a lot um, of little inconveniences throughout the day. And you're just like, yeah, it's gonna is this gonna go well tonight, or is this just not gonna be my day? You know. Uh, as you're talking about this, I've have you ever worked with like a drum tech? Have you ever had someone else who sets up your kit for you? Never had the okay had the luxury of that, unfortunately. Gotcha. But, my you know, part two is like I almost wonder if that would be more stressful, or like it seems nice to be able to not have to worry about that, but it feels like you would still worry about it, and it's such a you specific worry, thing. Yeah, you probably like, worry about it because yeah. like you know it, it is a lot more gear than everybody else mm -hmm. for one. Yeah. So you have to know that that person knows your setup like in and out mm -hmm. every single day and does not make any changes to it. So like mm -hmm. having that like on your mind would probably, you know, yeah, cause a little bit of worry. I, I I'm trying to pick my my adjectives and nouns here very carefully so I don't or share too much about someone who No, yeah. that's fine. Um but one of my friends was drum teching for a, a successful metal band. Uh, and the drummer of that band had a certain thing he liked done to his sticks every day and a certain way to help him grip the sticks. Yeah. Uh, and my friend was telling me how like he would like do the thing to the sticks and then take it to the drummer and he'd be like, nope, and just go do a hundred more sticks because whatever thing wasn't right. And it was one of those that my, my friend was kind of pissed off at first. I'm like, dude, fuck you. Like it's close enough. And then yeah. the more it's like, no, and it, it, there's so much gear with drums. Everything has to be perfect. There is no room for the symbol to be an inch over. Like if it, yeah. Fuck it. It has to be right. Yeah. And it was a kind of an interesting for, thing for me to appreciate. Like you said, how many annoyances and nuisances are as a drummer of so many things have to go right and they have to stay right for months where like a guitar, it's like you don't really break a guitar every six months, but or sorry, every six weeks. Like yeah. a guitar is going to last the tour. Probably a symbol. Probably not. Like you're probably going to break a symbol, a drum head. Like it just seems like there's so many more variables to keep yeah. track of. I, I would rather be like, mad at myself for like making a small mistake yeah. in setting up something one night just because I wasn't thinking mm -hmm. you know then be you know mad at somebody else if if it was their their job to do yeah. it you know like I just I would feel yeah. too I would feel too bad it you seems know weird yeah so I was 
Yeah, I was curious. Yeah, was, you yeah. were talking about all the drum stuff. I was like, oh, I wonder. Because, yeah, it seems like such a weird thing. And I don't think I've ever got to pick the brain of a drummer who's had that luxury. But it's like, I, I'm sure it is a luxury when you're Metallica. It's like, of course, he can't be out there setting sure. up his kit. But, like, there's a, a line somewhere in there where it's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to name a band. But, if you're, yeah, if you're someone who's kind of making a living, like, at what point is it more of a headache and more of a nuisance to right. bring someone in for something that is, like, a guitar tech seems great. Like, tuning guitar is kind of universal. I assume once you know the tuning, you know what it's supposed to be. Like, yeah, everyone can twist the strings and whatever. Yeah, and, I mean, there's pros out there that they're, obviously, some of them, most of them, I would imagine, are, you know, players themselves. Yeah. So it's just kind of like a universal thing, like you would say, like mm-hmm. most drum techs would be, Yeah, you know? Um, they, they're all players, mm-hmm. so it just kind of goes hand in hand. So, I mean, some people you could probably put a lot more trust in that, you know, than you normally would. But like I said, for, for me, I, I would just, I would, I would feel too bad if like someone yeah. made a, a mistake, you know, trying to set up something for me and, and I would, I would just feel too bad. Like I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't put that, not that on them, you know, on the, uh, on the note of gear, uh, I know that you got a new drum kit. Uh, and I, I did. so yeah, I want to ask you about this. And of course I'm ignorant to drums, but my, my big question is like, I, yeah, I'm curious what makes you, I think you switched drum brands as well. I did. Um, so yeah, I guess it's a good place to start for me as a, as an athlete, it feels like you went from Adidas to Nike. So they're both big brands. You just kind of chose this identity over that one. Is that like a fair summary or a fair comparison? I mean, I, I don't really, I don't really think of it that way, Okay. but yeah. it's, it's kind of just like, I don't know. I I in, I loved my SJC kit, mm-hmm. um, but I grew up on Tama. Okay, uh, Tama was the first kit I ever had. So going back to it, um, you know, I had wanted to get my hands on a Star Classic for a long time, but I didn't have funds for that mm-hmm. ever. <laughs> yeah. So uh, f- finally, being able to to get that was just like a, a big thing for me because it was just I felt like what I talked about how you kind of like lose that, that love for your instrument in mm-hmm. a way. I felt like I had gained some of that back by like going back and it just made me think of like when I was first starting to play, really like cool. when I was a kid. So it was definitely a, a big, big thing for me. Uh, what, what helps elicit that feeling? So obviously it's the brand name on the, on the kick drum, but I know that isn't what defines the drum. So that is what, tells idiots like me what it is but for an expert drummer or more experienced drummer because i think people don't like being called experts um, but for a more experienced drummer like yeah what makes that uh what makes the kit an upgrade to you how is this kit better than the kit you had previously well i i think they're both uh they're both great drum sets it's mm-hmm. you know it's not really a matter of of comparison as far okay. as what's better and what's not so good but Jesus, um, I'm a mess today <laughs> That's okay. That's my phone going off. <laughs> was, there was a soccer game I wanted to watch yesterday. That was my alarm. <laughs> my soccer game was starting. Uh, uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, the drum kit. Yeah, you're saying they're kind of both parallel, and that it's a it's a preference thing. It's not yeah, it's a, really it really was just a personal preference. Mm-hmm. You know, I just wanted to go back to it and make a change and go back to what I knew. Mm-hmm. You know, from when I was a kid, and 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 just try to rekindle that that love that I was yeah. missing for my instrument because mm-hmm. I felt like I had been without it for her losing a bit of it for for a while Mm -hmm. you know it just felt more like you know this is this is a job yeah you know and i wanted to go back to this being you know this was fun too yeah you know and i don't know part of you know there's always something fun in a new gear day of course you know so like i don't know it was just it wasn't a matter of like comparison of what was Mm -hmm. better than the other it was just kind of like I'm going back to what I what I know it, and what I loved as a as a kid. It sounds like you got your, like your childhood dream kit. It and was so in that sense. It was. It's yeah. It is you know? irrelevant whether it's better or worse. Like none of those things matter. What matters is that it, what your six year old self thought was the coolest thing in the world is now yours, and yeah. that is the the feeling that you're tapping into, which is an interesting um, interesting thing. Did you change any uh, any of the dimensions of the drums like did the kit itself change or do you feel like you found no it's all it's all still the same um i mean the sjc had two kick drums Mm -hmm. Uh, this only has one which obviously you know when we play shows live like i'm not gonna lug around two kick drums yeah you know it was really just for for videos and stuff that that kind of purpose um so i mean it just kind of didn't really matter 
at the end of the day. I, I liked having two kick drums. It, you know, felt like having, you know, a big kit like yeah. um I, I did as I did as a teenager, I had a, a, a large kit, a large pearl kit mm. that had two kicks and like three rack toms, two floor toms. And um I just kinda like wanted that back mm-hmm. for a little while and then uh when I got the Tama I was just like, Yeah, you know, it doesn't really matter mm-hmm. at the end of the day because I gotta lug this thing on and off stage. So <laughs> It is what it is. Uh, and of course, one more thing to get in and out of the van. And it, yeah, it's not just on and off stage. There's all the other pieces yeah. and it's more drum heads. You probably and... could do without the extra kick drum case in the in the yep. trailer. So, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Save money on space. gas, if nothing else. Like it, just, it goes Maybe. so far down the line to me. Um, interesting. And then are the the symbols, is that all the same still? Or is that when you get a new kit, is that also upgraded? Uh, no. All, so all the symbols, I still use Minel. Okay. Um, I've been using Minel for probably about five six years mm-hmm. um i just i just love their symbols you know i i was a zildjian guy for a long time as well you know starting out and uh i don't know i just i just love their symbols mm-hmm. they're they're great they don't i haven't had a i've had maybe like one or two crack mm-hmm. over the course of a few years rather than you know, uh, a couple of Zildjian's crack, you know, within a, a short, a very short time span. Yeah. So that's, that was important to me. You know, I just want something that's going to actually last. Yeah. You know, Jones not, are- not dogging on Zildjian in any way, shape or form. I'm just sure. saying like, you know, it's all about how you hit. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think when I was younger, I was probably a little bit more like <laughs> kind of beat the shit out of something, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. a lot more and yeah, didn't realize, yeah. oh yeah, I got to buy these over again and Mm -hmm. pay more money for them so yeah yeah they just they they last and uh yeah i haven't really made any changes to that that's cool it sounds like you kind of like found like your kit set up in the way that you uh in the way that's ideal for you and i think it's a weird part of drums where like a guitar in my brain maybe a guitarist would disagree but it's like there's six strings or seven strings or eight strings. Like it kind of is what it is. And I'm sure they talk about the wood and the distance of the frets and the size of the fretboard. And like, I know there are other parameters, but again, it's not a drum kit where you can add another kick tom or another kick, another, yeah, another kick, another tom, another floor, whatever, yeah. Uh, yeah. whatever words I'm going to try and pretend to use. <laughs> no, I'm using. Um, but it is kind of a weird thing, but it's cool that it sounds like you found your, your setup of the kit and how that all, I mean, is that a, is that a process through your yeah through your early years that you're always adding subtracting pieces or do you feel like your kit has kind of been standard for a while? Um, it it's been mostly standard mm-hmm. for a while. Um, you know, I did like having those two kits that were you know larger than than the other ones that I've had in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just kind of like I just wanted something big. Yeah, you know, something that would just it would most likely parts of it would stay at the practice space or wherever I yeah. kept it. You know, so, um, yeah, it was just kind of standard. Standard five piece would just, that would suffice more than enough for me. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny to hear you be so uh, so meek about what you use for drums and, of course, what you're playing on drums. It sounds like you're just like a casual drummer. And it's like, no, 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 we're not talking about a normal five piece yeah. drummer. And <laughs> we're talking about crazy blast beats and all the fun stuff. Uh, my question is then, yeah, on the note of drumming itself and the in the context of blast beats, like, yeah, you like to play fast, you play really technical, intricate stuff, uh, which is about as far away for me as I can imagine. Like, it's I can kind of imagine playing guitar, I can not imagine playing drums, and a blast beat is like the furthest thing down the line for me. Uh, what does practice then look like for you? So I assume it's a process of if the song is at 200 BPM, you get it at 160 and then work to 170. Is that kind of a fair thing? Do you feel like you're able to just pick things up and play them? What is yeah, with it's, learning process, it's actually like. pretty pretty flu you know fluid like you say it's mm-hmm. just kind of pick it up and just start trying to play it mm-hmm. you know and and get a feel for it you know i would i would warm up with just like you know hand exercises you know uh double stroke rolls and stuff like that just to kind of get the hands and the wrists you know going mm-hmm. and same with the feet just you know mm-hmm. you gotta do is sit there and do that for a little while and yeah you know your your feet are warmed up you know and that's that's pretty much all i would do do you feel like you're still, are you still on YouTube chasing exercises for how to increase the speed of this or technique of that? Or do you feel like you're kind of warmed up and then? For enjoying? my hands, yeah. For my feet, not so much uh, upon learning, you know, the heel toe and, and double strokes on the feet. Okay. You know, I kind of use that religiously through, especially throughout this record. Mm-hmm. Um, so now it's just kind of like mostly trying to figure out how to get that hand speed back up a little bit. 
Um, I actually used to be faster when I was younger, so it's just kind of like, oh, I'm starting to notice that I'm not interesting playing 300, you know, BPM blasts on my right hand as as often as I used to, interesting. or anything like that. So, yeah, I I, I mean, I'll, I'll catch myself every now and again, you know, checking out some videos on like push pull technique and you know rudiments and stuff like that. Is that a is that a normal trajectory for drummers and again I always think in the the athlete thing and it's like it makes sense to me that as an athlete by 30 you can throw a baseball faster than you can at 40 and in the context of drums it's like it kind of makes sense to me that you could blast beat faster at 25 than you can at 30 or as you grow as I it think a I think thing? yeah I, I mean I I think doing anything physically obviously when mm -hmm. you get older you know you start to kind of slow down a little bit yeah you know so yeah. you just gotta have to find your way to keep up with it that's interesting that's why you know with the feet thing in particular you know doing double stroke rolls that's just or sorry like heel toe and double strokes that's you know a, a technique in itself that almost just feels like you're uh it's like you know it's heel down and then um heel toe up mm -hmm. so Upon learning that, that's making two notes. Mm -hmm. So the more you get that down, the faster it's going to get, the more you keep practicing it, and yeah. then next thing you know, you're you're flying. <laughs> Do you, you still know? remember like learning blast beats? Like, Yeah, I guess uh, I assume at some point you would start drumming at 10, and I'm curious about when you start drumming. 10 years old. Is it 10? Uh, and then that's a wild number to just guess quack. You know? yeah. um, and then I assume you learned through... How do you learn drums? Is it through like pop punk ish stuff or is it directly into metal? So actually this is um when I was growing up, uh I had a, a neighbor. Um he his dad played in a punk band in the eighties and then he had uh like a cover band, like a bar cover band. They would play like, you know, Green Day and um offspring and like you know mostly like pop punk like type covers and stuff like that and they had like the full setup in their basement like all the lights they even had like the smoke machines that's cool like all that stuff and and this was actually how i decided on going with tama because the kit that was in there it was a tama swing star and that was the first kit i ever bought i bought the same exact one i got the same one for that's my cool. birthday a year later that's cool and i and i used that kit for for years mm -hmm. and um but it started with that it's like green day covers and well no not not necessarily with the music it was just like i sat down on that drum kit and obviously like the first thing you're gonna most likely play is gonna be like smells like teen spirit or mm -hmm. something like that which yeah. in my case it was and um as i was starting to get older um you know i was listening to a lot of new metal stuff at the start so corn slipknot you know the whole the whole thing and i wanted nothing more than to be like joey jordison and like he he will forever be my idol you know uh, as a drummer um so i really just started like trying to learn how to play those songs and when I started playing them, because like my buddy that had the kit, you know, across the street from me, he started seeing that I was playing like and getting better and better. And he was like, holy crap, like I didn't expect you to get this good like so fast. And it just kept going from there and I wouldn't stop. And I would play like four to five hours a day. Yeah. Fortunately, I don't have that luxury of doing that anymore. <laughs> but, you know, still. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a lot of time to do it and I would just, you would never see me out of the basement of my house. It was like a creature like down there, you know, like, <laughs> uh, is your family musical Were they kind of supportive of this or were you kind of the black sheep deviating from whatever was normal? Uh, so yeah, I, I'm actually the only, I was really the only like musical person in my family. Um, upon my mother discovering her biological family, um, I guess you'd call him my grand uncle. Okay. Because um, she's my, or he's my 
mom's uncle on, on that side. Uh, he was actually a jazz drummer in the 50s. So it kind of just like, when I found that out a couple of years ago, it just kind of clicked. I'm like, maybe that's why I do what I do, mm-hmm. you know? I, I don't know. Yeah. But it was definitely crazy to, to see that somebody other yeah. than me was involved in something like that. But other than that, every other part of my family, no. There was there was no... That's cool. No musical. It's a cool time. I think jazz and metal, I think, in my brain, are closer tied than they might initially appear, just in the intricacies and the technicality of it. Like, they're, I guess they're both for advanced musicians in my brain. Like, I don't think, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if there's any accuracy to that, but somehow jazz, I don't know, somehow it adds up that he would be interested in jazz and that a couple generations later that is now what, yeah. it is, what is in your brain. I mean, I, I love jazz music. Mm-hmm. I, I don't listen to enough of it, though, and mm-hmm. I feel like I should. And I feel like I should dabble more in like trying to learn um, like jazz, cho- you know, jazz chops mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But I just I don't know. I kind of just go about my own way whenever I sit down to practice for the time that I have or if I'm recording something like I'm dedicated to doing that, getting it done and sending it on its way. Stuff like that. Uh, we chatted about the social media stuff earlier, and I know you're very good, or I think you're very good about being uh, consistent with uploads of drum covers. And this is what I'm practicing today. This is what I was playing today, uh, which I think goes back to your early conversation about the YouTube and putting everything up there and just giving it a chance to shine. And I think it's a similar mindset here of, yeah, just keep putting stuff out. Keep giving people a chance to see what you're working on and be involved with you. And um, uh, where was I going with that? Um, oh, those are often in my brain are often metal stuff stuff that is similar or stuff that i expect you to be playing is there other times where you're playing like do you play rap are there other stuff that you like playing that is totally separate from this world or are you pretty cemently in this i house? do jam to like different stuff every now and again mm-hmm. um you know obviously like i'll i'll go for the metal stuff obviously but mm-hmm. um yeah i mean i'll find myself playing along to um plenty of different stuff you know i mean I just like a lot of I like a lot of classic rock and and stuff like that. So like I'll find myself kind of just playing like a lot of Kiss, you yeah. know, and, and stuff because Kiss was like my favorite mm-hmm. band. Do when you I was a kid. play it uh, the way it was initially played, or are you kind of remix? I it? try to emulate it, and and but I will throw in like a of few course. things every so often. Yeah. But like I do try to emulate like in in Kiss's case, like mm-hmm. I will emulate try my best mm-hmm. to do all of Peter Chris's parts like note for note mm-hmm. from what I know after listening to that band for many, many years. So I assume there's also a value in as you play it note for note, you gain. Yeah. I think the normal thing to do is play 90% of it. And as you play it note for note, you really get an appreciation of how he did things and yeah. the little nuances of the drums. Is that kind of, are you almost studying it in that sense where you're really dissecting it and absorbing all of his yeah nuances? to how I he think drum some parts? will sit down and will study like through, you know, tabs and, and, and paper. I like to, you know, I was, I was a self-taught drummer, so I, I did everything on my own and it was just a matter of you give me a song. I listen to it a few times and I know like the basis for it, Mm -hmm. you know? So over time of listening to that song over and over and over and over again, I would start to get the other stuff that came around with it that I didn't catch. Mm Mm-hmm. And sometimes it'll, you know, depending on how I feel that day, it'll be either really, really good or sure. or I'll miss a couple of things, you know. Do you so. find yourself spending much time in the theory side of stuff or is it more of just the practical? No, but I do need to dive a little bit further into the whole theory thing. I, I've put it off for a long, long time. And uh, I think it's something that I would actually, I should probably try and get into a bit more. It's a weird thing that, yeah, some... I feel like people are either super into it or just kind of not interested in it. Yeah. And it's interesting to me, again, from a sports brain, it's like I would think that one of those would be dominant by now, that somehow we one of those two mindsets would have asserted itself as more successful than the other. And it's interesting mm-hmm. to me that in uh, among successful musicians, but there's still both of those. And some people love theory and are so invested in all the time signatures and all the nuances. And some people are just like, no, I'm just feel it and play it. And the time signature changes all, yeah, play that too, whatever. I think there's just nothing better than just like feeling it out mm-hmm. and playing it. Yeah. And even just, you know, even if you don't play it exactly the way that it was on record or anything, it's just, you know. You're not you, that. <laughs> no, you, <laughs> yeah. you'll never, never will be. But yeah. it's just, you know, I don't know, the, the feel of it. Mm-hmm. I think that's just so 
much more meaningful to me. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's just my opinion. But, you know, some people like to learn it note for note, right out of the gate on paper or whatever. And, and that's cool, too, you know. Hell yeah. Uh, we chatted a lot about the Euclid stuff. And as I was scrolling through your social medias before yeah. this, I know that you're also you have uh, Alters of Iran. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Uh, so it's Alters of Aron. Aron. I'm pretty sure that I pronounced that right. I'm going to go with Alters for the moment. <laughs> don't kill me, Lou. You know? um, but so you're involved with this, uh, another metal band you have. I saw you filled in on a music video. You're drumming. I mean, it feels like you're just drumming in everything. How many, what else is going on? So we have Euclid, Alters. Yeah. Are those the two big projects? What else is happening? So those two, and then there is one other, but I can't get into too much info okay. about that one yet. It's kind of like a, a behind the scenes thing where we're, we're trying yeah. to get everything ironed out. Hell yeah. But uh, how do you have the time and creativity <laughs> to invest in so many different things? I think just because we're all like the the two other groups mm-hmm. that's not Euclid, everybody's all in different parts of the country. Gotcha. So it kind of just goes hand in hand that we just we write all the music, we get all the music stuff done first. Then, you know, you make time to, you know, for everybody to get together, get their plane tickets or whatever, get together, do a video. And just kind of go about it that way and see where the demand lies, you know, when it comes out, Mm -hmm. you know. So it's just that's just been uh, an easier process for me to pick up on multiple projects because I was horrible at at multitasking and trying to do two uh, bands at once uh, when I was in Shadow and Oceano at the same time. That was for some reason I just like couldn't couldn't handle it. It was just too much. Interesting. Uh, What? Was it like traveling was too much? Just too much creativity that you were splitting? Like what what felt the most overwhelming about that experience? I just felt like I wasn't giving a hundred percent. It was either one or the other. Yeah, you know, not completely. So that's tough. Yeah, yeah. It was it was very difficult. You know, um, but no. that's just the way that the way that it it, it panned out. You know, yeah. and that, that's all. And then with Euclid and Alters now, or Alter, and then the, the third project, uh, how do you, do you feel like they're musically similar enough that you can uh, assign ideas to them? Or how do you, like, when you get a drum idea in your head, how do you say, this is a Euclid idea, this is an Alters idea, or I'm going to save this for the other thing? Um, I mean, these two bands are, are definitely different from each other. Okay. Um, Alters is more uh, just kind of like... <sighs> It's like the symphonic stuff that you hear, but without the symphonic stuff in it, you know? Um, It is way more, like, just metal-driven, I feel. Even though it's got a lot, you know, it's mostly deathcore, it's still very, very metal-driven. While I feel like the third project that we're working on, although it started as a very metal-driven, a very heavy deathcore group... Um, we're kind of diving into different elements as far as uh, just stuff that like we listened to when we were growing up and mostly a lot of new me- metal influence going into that too. You know, I kind of like to put a little bit of everything into it. So, you know, we have a couple songs that we started working on that I started uh, editing drums for and, and it's definitely very different from what I would normally do. There's still parts of me that you you know that would be like oh yeah that's that's definitely mm-hmm. all you you know playing blast beats and stuff like that like you normally do yeah but there's just a lot of stuff that you know you probably wouldn't expect from me yeah. as a you know full blown like deathcore death metal mm-hmm. drummer you know so I'm excited for 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 people to hear that and and what reception will follow with it that's fun you know. Uh, do you find that being involved with so many different things like almost feeds the creativity? Like for me with music videos, I feel like uh, if I, uh, I think if I only had to do music videos for one band, it would, it would just get tiring. I would lose something. And I think by exploring different ideas, it invigorates me and it gives me a new perspective on things. Is working with different bands kind of a way that does it also further inspire new ideas? Like how it does, does kind of help with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, especially if something is like drastically different. Mm-hmm. Because then you, you know, you'll go back to something that you started with another project and be like, you know what, this would actually sound really cool if I did this instead, you know. So, yeah, I I think it's 
it's very helpful in the creative process, especially if you run into like a little bit of a, a, a roadblock, mm-hmm. you know, in trying to write. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. Um, hell yeah, dude. We are just about to our hour mark. Uh, so as we work towards wrapping up here, <laughs> I told you before, I'm like half looking for an electric kit and I'm like half joking here, but my, I am also half serious here because to me it's like, uh, I think I can play guitar a little bit. And I think yeah. to me, it's very valuable when I'm on set just to be able to empathize with what I'm working with or when I'm seeing someone on stage, like just to understand what the thing is. And with drums, I don't know, like I'm just so ignorant to them. Uh, so it seems valuable in that sense. And also in the sense of like, it seems so unlearnable to me that it seems valuable to then go and learn it and to tackle that mountain and teach, like convince myself again. It's like, no, 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 I can do whatever I want to do. I just got to put the time yeah. in to do it. Uh, so I think then... It's like, yeah, I'm never going to get a real kit because it. Yeah, I don't want to do all the noise and all the stuff. Yeah, so I think yeah. an electric kit is a, a good place to start. And yeah, I think, what am I looking for in an electric kit? If you are guiding a friend or something. <laughs> so I would say like a, if, if you can, uh, obviously Roland is, you know, m- the number one, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but some of the Alesis kits out there are not are not bad either. Um, the uh, I think it's the Alesis Strike Pro. Uh, that one's, you know, you get a little bit more bang for your buck. I think it was like twenty five, twenty six hundred dollars, and mm-hmm. you get like a full, you know, kick, two racks, two floors, a snare, hi hat, uh, two crashes, and a ride. I think, I think even an extra crash. And I mean, the module's not bad either. It's got some pretty good presets on it, and you just mess around with it and make it sound however you want, or you use, you know, a DAW and put your own stuff in there. So I, I, I would say, you know, obviously first, first pick though would be Rowan. I've Mm -hmm. used Rowan for a while. And I mean, that's just, that's the go-to for, for most people that are wanting to get an an actual electronic kit. For my, uh, my budget ass who's exploring something, I'm not sure I'm going to stick with it. 2,500 sounds steep. (laughs) Is like what, uh, I, on some of the, uh, a $300 electric kit, I assume is garbage and not worth touching. Like, I mean, not necessarily. There's, uh, there is like uh, a lot of stuff that, um, believe it or not, you can find them on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I, I would still like just for the, um, just for the quality if you're going to try something budget, I would stick with Alesis. They mm-hmm. have plenty of, you know, models under that one mm-hmm. that are going to be, you know, definitely way more affordable. Yeah. Um, but there's also like ones I see, I see guys playing on ones that they bought off of Amazon, you know, with these, with these brand names I've never heard of that they're just, it's kind of like they buy it just to see how it compares to, some of the top dogs and mm. and and some of them don't do so bad. So if anything I would say like if if you're looking for something like super cheap, go on there. See what you find from there. You, know, you probably action. find something that might actually just be good just as a start. Yeah. You know, and just for practicing. Hell yeah. And I assume it's like the I assume in terms of quality of electric kits, we're talking about like the the way the drum feedback feels and how realistic it Probably feels. that, maybe the electronics, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not too sure. I've never really dabbled on like any of those those yeah. cheaper ones so <laughs> I, I don't I know much about hundred dollar cameras yeah, yeah, I w- yeah i wouldn't really i wouldn't really know but yeah. you know i just see people like posting videos you know doing like reviews on them mm-hmm. and comparing them to what they had which was you know which may have been better and and some of them you know stand out to be you know pretty mm-hmm. pretty on point with the competition so hell yeah yeah I'll check it out and I'll let you know when I start drumming. Hell yeah. It'll be a ways off. But uh, I would, yeah, it sounds like a, like I said, I think it's just because it seems so impossible. It's like, no, I need to do that. I need to not let that be impossible. I need to tell myself like, yeah. nah, <laughs> we're going to figure it out. We're going to make it happen. Uh, Matt, my man, I appreciate you coming through. Uh, anything people should check out, obviously, Euclid. Uh, Revilement. I almost said yes. like defilement. <laughs> Revilement. Uh, Revilement is out now everywhere. Go stream that. Uh, where else can people follow you? What else they should look out for? What else is coming up in the life of Matt? So we have, um, we've been working on some more new music. We have more new things coming as far as the Euclid camp goes. Oh, yeah. um, Alters has new music on the way. And the third project, whenever <laughs> it, you know, 
comes to light, you will all definitely see it. Hell yeah. And where are you at on social media? What can people, it'll all be in the description bio, whatever the thing is. Yep. But yeah, where can people find you on, on uh, those So platforms? on Instagram, you can find me at Coco Drums. Um, and then as far as Facebook, just my name, Matthew Kowanowski. And that's where I just post most of my stuff, just dabbling around playing drums. So. Hell yeah, dude. Appreciate you coming through. Go check out Euclid. Go check out the new album. And we'll talk soon. Sweet. Hell yeah.